to Hark Strike for the invitation to talk to you while you enjoy your lunch. Um, these are my disclosures. I have a formula which I've licensed to uh, several manufacturers. But the topic today is focused on one specific aspect of calculations, and that's the role of this very interesting new parameter, the posterior cornea, in our calculations, and to look at theoretical modeling versus uh, direct uh, measurement. So let's jump into the essence, and the essence is this, that ever since Javal introduced his keratometer, when we measure keratometry, we're measuring the anterior surface. And we account for the posterior cornea by basically a fudge factor, which is accounted for by the so-called keratometer index. You can be more sophisticated. You can use a Gaussian model for the cornea. And you see in the Gaussian model for the cornea, suddenly the posterior cornea appears. So even if you don't measure it, you can use the Gull strand ratio to plug into your Gaussian model for corneal power. But now we have uh, new devices, uh, Scheinflug, uh, Swift Source OCT devices, which can directly measure the posterior cornea. And we can plug in the actual direct measurements in place of the assumed values for the posterior cornea. So having new devices, new biometers, um, is part of the puzzle. But most evidence suggests that so far, using direct measurements of the posterior cornea has been somewhat disappointing. And the reason, uh, I believe, is what's been missing is the best way to use this information within formulae. So my own formula, uh, the universal uh, two, is uh, paraxial ray tracing, Gaussian thick lens formula, and it's well suited to using this new parameter, which we now have, the posterior cornea. And, um, the version of the Barrett Universal, which does allow you to use a posterior cornea um, as implemented in the Zeiss Almos 700, is called the Barrett Universal TK. And of course, it's available online on the uh, online website at apacrs.org. <clears throat> so the potential for measuring the posterior cornea is threefold, potentially for spherical power, for toric cylinder prediction and for post-refractive cases. Let's look at each in turn. As far as spherical power, there's two elements to spherical prediction. One is divergence calculation for lens power, the other is the ELP prediction. So the ELP prediction stays basically the same, but divergence prediction is now based potentially on this new parameter. If you look at the universal formula, it performs uh, well in comparison to traditional formulae. It even performs well in comparison to some of the newer formulae based on uh, AI. And if you look at the publication in ophthalmology uh, a little while back, you'll see that the prediction error versus axial length is very flat compared to earlier formulae. And this is the reason why you don't need to have special formulae for short, medium, and long eyes, because the new modern formulae are pretty flat across the axial range rate. And uh, this is a series of patients which I performed, uh, looking at outcomes, spherical outcomes uh, initially, looking at the Universal 2 with standard K versus the Universal 2 with TK, which is posterior cornea. So first, let's look at standard K. And you can see here, and I'll just highlight the percentage of patients within a half doctor. So you can see with uh, modern formulae, you can get excellent prediction with standard keratometry, 95% within a half doctor uh, in this series. It's always good to look at the box plot because the box plot shows you the first and third quartile, it shows you the outliers, and essentially the more compact the box, the better. If you then do the same comparison, same patients, but now use um, not the standard K, but the TK, the posterior measured cornea, 
you can see it still does well, 91.4%. It's still better than the other formulae, but it's actually not better than what I showed you with the standard K. Now, this is with normal eyes, so that's a proviso. And once again, showing you the, the box plot. What's quite reassuring, if you look at the optimized lens factor for standard K, or the optimized lens factor for when the posterior corner is measured, there's very little difference, 0.07. So it's reassuring that you can use the same constants for both versions of the formulae. Let's look at toric prediction now, toric cylinder prediction. And um, we've learned so much about toric prediction. We've learned um, not to use the mean magnitude for SIA, we use a centroid value instead. We've learned to make our axis at a consistent location, keep it small, and particularly use uh, SIA of the centroid value, different methods of alignment, def big improvements. And all these have helped the puzzle of predicting toric outcomes uh, accurately. Uh, as far as prediction formulae, perhaps one of the most important uh, events was Doug Koch's lecture in 2012, because he reminded us not to forget the posterior cornea. And there's various ways you can use the posterior cornea, regression, ray tracing. My own method is a theoretical model. It's not a regression-based method. It's not a population-derived method, but based on an explanation which I came up in my mind to explain the ph phenomenon of posterior corneal astigmatism, based essentially on the fact that the eye has a larger diameter in the horizontal meridian. But one thing which is uh, within my formula is a recognition of something which not really everybody uh, comprehends, and that is when you measure the cornea with uh, any device, you measure on the visual axis. But the optical elements of the eye are aligned on the optical axis. And this difference, angle alpha, the difference between the optical axis, makes the lens appear to be tilted. And the lens tilt adds an additional component to the unexplained against the rule of stigmatism, which we observe. And so whether you use my formula on a theoretical model or you use it on a direct measurement, an algorithm accounts for this missing piece of information, both predicted and measured posterior corneal astigmatism. If you look at the literature, this method does well. This was a paper uh, published by a group from Portugal where the toric calculator uh, performed well in comparison to uh, other methods. And so in this study, I'm looking at the same series of patients, but I'm looking at the toric prediction. And I'm comparing traditional holiday toric calculator to the Barrett toric calculator, both the theoretical model and the measured posterior cornea. So here's the uh, study, and you see, once again, 210 hours. Most of the patients were toric because 80% of my practice uh, have toric lenses uh, implanted. And we're looking at the predicted uh, error in residual astigmatism. So you see here now, um, this is using a comparison of holiday initially, no posterior cornea, only 48% within a half doctor. If you give a toric calculator just the total corneal power, it still doesn't do that great, 61%. But you need to use the baritoric calculator either with a measured posterior cornea and, or the predicted posterior cornea, and you can see both do well, 80.5% and 88%. Similar to the sphere in my hands, measuring the posterior cornea does well, but in conventional eyes, I don't see it offering uh, a distinct advantage compared to standard uh, keratometry. And the final group of patients to consider are those post-refractive. And perhaps this is one of the most challenging areas we face today in our day-to-day -day practices, dealing with patients who've had LASIK. Because of course, when you've had LASIK, um, what happens is you flatten the cornea, but you don't change the posterior cornea. So that ratio between posterior to anterior radius of curvature has been changed. And the assumption that formulae they make is no longer actually true. So that requires special formulas for post-refractive patients. One of those formulas is the TrueK formula. And uh, compared to other formulae on the ASPRIS website, it's shown to be uh, more accurate, uh, particularly when no history is available. 
uh, more recent publication that was in 2016. This is uh, towards the end of last year with hyperopic prediction. It does well as well. Once again, the no history is still doing well, 73.4%. And in RK, this is a paper that has been accepted for publication. We had good results using the true K for patients post RK. Uh, particularly when a patient has had previous refractive surgery, you cannot use a standard Tori calculator. You cannot use a, a modern calculator which accounts for the posterior cornea because it's changed. You need a specific Tori calculator. And this is the true K Tori calculator. This is a specialized version for post-refractive patients. You can see 74% within a half doctor versus holiday, uh, versus holiday with AK regression. So what about measuring the posterior cornea? So perhaps something new I'll tell you today is that when it comes to choosing the best method for post-refractive patients, I would think you should consider version two of the of the true K formula, it's only available online, it's not available on any barometer as yet, because I think this is going to prove to be something that will give us better uh, predictions. So when you press on calculate, you're given an option, predicted or measured posterior cornea. And if you um, go on and, and select the universal formula, you'll see that the default gives you just the normal predicted posterior cornea. That's what you're used to with the true K. But if you go back to the patient data and now select measured posterior cornea, you'll be presented with a new page. You select your device and you enter the measured posterior cornea. Please be sure that you tell the formula whether you're putting in the radius or you're putting in the power of the posterior cornea because the values are very similar, but it has to know what you've put in. Ignore negative signs, minus signs, just put in the absolute value for the posterior corneal, uh, measured posterior cornea. Then when you go back to uh, the patient data, and you press uh, calculate, and then you select uh, universal formula, you then have a prediction which is based now on the measured posterior cornea. So this is an option which has only been available maybe six to 12 months. Now, if you look at the results, and these are 60 eyes, my own, Mike Lawless, and Tun Kwan uh, from Singapore, and we're comparing now the prediction accuracy of true K with and without posterior cornea compared to the conventional or other methods for post-refractive patients. So here you see we have with true KTK, 70% within a half diopter versus 63% with the model posterior cornea versus the other methods. And if you see graphically here, uh, both the true K with measured or predicted does well, but there is here a distinct advantage. It's statistically significant better with the measured posterior cornea rather than one based on a theoretical model. And, um, I don't know what happened to the screen, but equally interesting, if you um, go back to the true K-Tori calculator, you get the same option. You can use the measured posterior cornea for the true K-Toric. And then the uh, display toric lens that you um, measure will be based on the measured posterior cornea. And uh, in a smaller number of patients, only 23 eyes, comparing the true K-Toric calculator with standard Ks, or with the posterior cornea, once again, you see that the toric prediction is better again with the true K toric measured posterior cornea than the true K toric predicted. The differences are small. Both methods are definitely better than uh, the other methods of toric prediction post-refractive surgery. And as yet, with these numbers, 23 eyes, I couldn't detect a statistical significance, but I think it will be there. So for those challenging cases, um, this will improve your prediction, the measured posterior cornea after ref uh, refractive surgery. Uh, standard spherical prediction, I can't see a distinct benefit from using posterior cornea. Same with toric, with normal eyes. Maybe there's a subgroup of unusual eyes, here the conus, et cetera, where it will still prove to be better.
but we haven't identified this subgroup yet. But even at this early stage of using these parameters, what I'm showing you in for post-refractive context, uh, it does improve your prediction and hope this gives you an insight into something which I think is going to become increasingly important, how best to utilize measured post-recornia in our formulae. Thank you very much.